Thank you very much, um, Ratna, and thank you so much for all of you for, uh, for dialing in. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to finally be able to uh, share with you the key findings from this uh, last three year of investigative research into the problem of human trafficking in Canada. I'm going to spend a very a little amount of time on, uh, on the details of particular cases in the time that I'm uh, going to take the next half hour here. What I'm going to be doing is focusing on the high level uh, statistics, um, key findings, and then we'll have time during the question and discussion period to get into more detail. Um, this is the start of a, a two-week national public awareness campaign to end modern-day slavery. I'm um, here in Toronto this morning uh, doing this session with you folks. Uh, on the uh, webinar, we have people from not just the media, but also I'm happy to see from, uh, from very senior folks in, in Ottawa, in Toronto, uh, in Victoria, with provincial and federal governments, both um, civil servants as well as elected officials. And so I really am grateful that you've taken the time to dial in today. Uh, this afternoon at 2 o'clock, we're going to be having a, a newser at uh, Queen's Park uh, for any media outlets that want to get on the news feed. Um, you can contract, contact Barbara Bauer, uh, and that will be uh, something that you can arrange through her. Uh, further on, tonight we've got an event at 7 o'clock at the University of Toronto. Um, this is our first public event. Um, it is completely sold out, which is, which is terrific. And that's the first of six uh, public events across the country that will take place. So all the details of this and to sort of track the progress of this national campaign is on the website and moderndayslavery.ca. All right, well, with the preamble out of the way, let's, um, let's get right into it. This is a, a brief overview of the, the next half hour talk. Uh, first off, most of you are familiar with hu human trafficking and what it is, but I'll just briefly define it for, for those of you who are not. And then I'm going to go through the key findings related to the three primary forms of human trafficking that are prevalent in Canada. I'll talk about the technology of trafficking because it turn, turns out that this is in fact a major role contributing in particular to uh, sex trafficking in Canada, both foreign and domestic. And then I'll talk about the issue of, uh, of demand. We'll then move on to discuss uh, evaluating Canada's response. As, as Ratna said, we're not just interested in, in taking the problem as it is. Um, there was a saying we used to use with the Future Group when we first started, and, and I think it's poignant to use it today. Um, most people are more comfortable with old problems than new solutions. And slavery is a very old problem, and we see modern day slavery in our own country. And it's the solutions which are debatable, and we want to see debate on them, and we'll be proposing um, what Canada should do and what our provincial government should do. As you see on this slide, traffickers have a plan, but Canada does not. Um, that's not merely a rhetorical statement. I'm going to show you today excerpts from a playbook provided to me by police that show that traffickers have been systematically targeting, in particular, Canadian underage girls for exploitation in the sex trade. And the fact that we do not yet have a national action plan is, uh, is a source of concern to me, and I'll be letting out uh, some recommendations today as to what that action plan should look like, and then, of course, we'll take questions. The concept of human trafficking is actually relatively well um, understood and defined. Uh, this is the definition that comes from the UN protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons. Canada signed this international treaty in 2000, so over a decade ago, as did over 117 other countries. So there is a universal definition, and this is the definition that, that I've used in uh, my research and for my book. So it has three parts. The first part is the act. An individual who's a trafficker either recruits or transports or transfers or harbors or receives people. So notice that while movement can be part of the human trafficking equation, it's not necessary. Now, any one of those acts is committed through any one of these listed means in number two. They range from relatively less egregious forms of, exploit of control to the more egregious. So they begin with deception. Traffickers also use fraud or coercion. They may abuse a position of power or authority. They may pay others in control of the victim. They may threaten to use force, actually use force, or engage in abduction. I can tell you that in the trafficking cases we've seen in Canada, we have seen every single one of these means being used, including abduction. Traffickers, however, are far more pleased to resort to the less egregious forms. It exposes them to less serious penal sanctions if they are apprehended. And it certainly makes it easier to control victims if you can deceive them uh, than it is to use outright physical force. And we'll go into some examples later of this. And then finally, it's for the purpose of exploitation. Internationally, we see sexual exploitation, forced labor, organ trafficking, servitude, slavery, or practices similar to slavery. 
Um, in Canada, we've documented uh, cases, numerous cases involving uh, sex and forced labor trafficking. Um, we have not documented any uh, organ trafficking uh, cases. Uh, we have documented servitude cases and practices uh, similar to slavery. Now here are the key findings uh, from a three-year study. So you can appreciate how tough it is to boil them down to one slide. So there's a lot more detail. We've been able to confirm that human trafficking is national in scope. Um, Invisible Chains documents cases in Victoria, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, Quebec City, Halifax. The list goes on and on. Um, these are just the major cities. It's important to note that numerous smaller cities and towns are also affected. Both sex trafficking and forced labor trafficking are occurring in Canada, and they have been for at least a decade. The victims are Canadian citizens as well as newcomers, adults as well as children, men as well as women. And in terms of the numbers, I'm confident in saying that there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of victims exploited in Canada every year. And finally, Canada is failing to effectively address this hidden national tragedy. While there have been some excellent measures that have been taken in uh, recent months and years, we're seeing an increasing level of attention being paid to the issue and some very positive uh, changes made in particular at the federal level with the passage of Bill C-268 to toughen the penalties for child traffickers, a problem that came directly out of this research study, as well as providing foreign victims with temporary resident permits and access to interim federal health care in 2006. Now is the time for a national strategy. Um, we've taken incremental steps forward to this point and now we have the database to move forward with a national action plan. I'd like to add that the RCMP's recent threat assessment that some of you are familiar with, uh, it's available on our website if you want to take a look at it, does provide um, a number of different uh, additional sources of confirmation of these details. The threat assessment is based on uh, law enforcement sources. It's not based on the broader uh, range of sources we consulted. So in addition to law enforcement, I also consulted with non-governmental organizations provincial uh, governments and agencies, immigration officials, and we obtained tens of thousands of access to information documents um, that were obtained, and that was very helpful in, in fleshing out the extent of the problem. Let's move on to some of the key findings now for foreign trafficking victims. In terms of the gender breakdown, these statistics uh, are based on an analysis that we did from the citizenship and immigration data from 2006 to 2008. Um, it's only in two, 2006 that a field was added to identify an individual as a suspected traffic person. Prior to that date, uh, CIC has absolutely no records um, that were systematically kept to do that. Even with the post-2006 statistics, um, they also uh, admit to being uh, not fully reflective of the, of the complete picture. These only really relate to victims who voluntarily uh, came forward to CIC, either through police, uh, immigration, another department, a lawyer, or on their own, and sought to remain in the country. So many victims who simply wish to go home uh, would not be captured in these. But in terms of gender, I think it's notable that one in four foreign trafficking victims in Canada are men. And the recent uh, case in Hamilton that I'll discuss later uh, really speaks to a further myth about trafficking that is being um, upended, and that's that it only affects women. It certainly disproportionately affects women, but there is a sizable portion of male victims in Canada. In terms of the ages, um, and these are the ages not of when the person maybe began their exploitation, but when they were identified. So um, I would just exercise some caution in, in, in uh, drawing too much from these. But most of them who came forward and were identified were adults. We saw a sizable number of cases reported through NGOs of minors who were brought forward, and we can talk about that further. In terms of the forms of exploitation, um, roughly an equal split between forced labor and sex trafficking. And I think that really, again, speaks to the lack of public awareness about forced labor trafficking and the greater uh, need for action on this as well. Finally, uh, an important statistic, less than 10% of victims came forward on their own initiative or with a lawyer to immigration authorities. Most had been identified by police or through some other um, outlet. So it again speaks to the concern that these victims are generally unable to access assistance on their own, and that's largely due to the control and, and threats and retaliation concerns that they have about their traffickers. In terms of the top four source countries, and again this is for all foreign trafficking cases, China, Moldova, the Philippines, and Romania uh, continue to be the top four source countries for foreign trafficking victims to Canada. These four countries alone represent two-thirds of all foreign victims who came forward to CIC between 2006 and 2008. 
Each of these countries has been flagged for years now by the U.S. State Department in the annual trafficking in persons report for failing to take the minimal steps required to combat the problem. Some of them are complicit in the crime, others of them uh, punish victims, and all of them are failing to meet the minimum standards necessary to combat the problem. Now, on a continental basis, um, we see approximately 59 to 60% of victims coming from Asia, 33% from Central and Eastern Europe, and then approximately 4% from both Africa and South America. Now, let's drill down now into the different forms of, of foreign trafficking victims that we see in Canada. The first is with respect to sex trafficking. We see a number of different uh, groupings of victims. The first, I have to say, was one, another that surprised me. We uncovered numerous victims in our research who were long-term sex slaves. These were women brought from uh, war zones uh, to Canada. Um, and when I speak of war zones, the former war zones, I'm talking about El Salvador after its civil war, Colombia, Chechnya, Sierra Leone, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. These are all areas where women have been systematically exploited through sexual violence during the war, and either during or after the war, it's created a pool of victims which we have seen traffickers bring to Canada seeking to make greater profits from their exploitation in our own country. And when I say long term, the longest term victim that has been identified here in Canada through our research was a sex slave who was first abducted at the age of nine from an orphanage in the Ukraine, sold for sex on three continents, and it was only when she was in her late 20s and early 30s that she was finally uh, identified in, in Edmonton after she was dumped outside of a hospital suffering so severely from her psychological problems and physical ailments that she could no longer make any profit for her traffickers. Now I'll get into this later in terms of what happened to her. Fortunately, Alberta has a system in place to help victims like that uh, today. The other group of individuals that are, are prevalent in the foreign sex trafficking uh, arena in Canada um, relates to prostituted women in developing countries. So these are people who are already under the control of traffickers in their home countries, or they may not have been. Um, so they're already being sold for sex in a developing country. They're told, you can come to Canada, you'll be doing essentially the same thing, but in better conditions and for higher pay. So this has been identified by international researchers already as a ready pool for victims. The concerns about victim blaming come up very prevalently here. So while these, this pool of, of uh, victim uh, may know that they're coming to Canada to engage in prostitution, once they get here, they're unable to leave. So the, the, the question of, of, of choice or consent is really a part of the public debate on these types of cases. Under the UN uh, definition of trafficking and under the Canadian Criminal Code definition, the alleged consent of a victim is supposed to be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now, you can't consent to being exploited, meaning you can't consent to having deception, fraud, force, or things like debt bondage, as you see on the screen, used to cause someone to continue to be sold. Any even nominal notion of consent in any um, civilized legal system includes the idea that you can remove uh, your consent. You, you don't just perpetually consent to being sold for sex. So the cases of, of prostituted women who come to Canada recruited by traffickers, they can then become trafficking victims if they're no longer able to leave the situation. And this is a common tactic involving debt bondage, and we've documented this in a number of uh, cases. So it's important to note that we've got these two extremes in terms of the types of victims. There's also uh, false offers of employment, so deception used to lure victims to Canada. That's increasingly uh, a common uh, fact that we're finding. Now, where are these victims being uh, found? Well, for foreign victims, it's primarily in these diverse arrays of so-called indoor um, venues. And when we hear people in the media talk about saying things like indoor prostitution or indoor sex acts are safer than on the street, uh, I can say conclusively that's 100% false. Um, being indoors made these individuals more vulnerable and less visible to the public. They were sold through micro brothels. These are apartments and condominiums that are literally embedded in our communities throughout Canada. A recent case in British Columbia had an entire network of micro brothels uh, throughout the BC Lower Mainland. The trafficking victim from China who subsequently came forward, one of nine women, uh, was being advertised on Craigslist. So at once she was fully visible to men who wanted to purchase sex acts, but at the same time kept hidden because she was moved throughout the BC Lower Mainland uh, condo microbrothel network. We've also seen foreign sex victims sold through escort agencies, massage parlors, and in strip clubs. There's a very, um, very vocal, I think it's fair to say very biased representative of the adult entertainment industry who speaks out quite frequently whenever the issue of human trafficking comes up. 
He was critical of the RCMP's recent public awareness campaign, which identified strip clubs as places where sex trafficking victims have been found. We have not only got multiple cases where sex trafficking victims have been found working in strip clubs, particularly in here in Ontario, but access information documents also reveal that the contracts being used uh, control these women. And I've included a, a, just a brief quote from, from a, a, an analysis done by the Canada Revenue Agency who looked into these contracts and found that they smacked of slavery. That's their words, not my own. And finally, advertised through Craigslist and sold through hotels and motels. We've seen that as well with foreign sex trafficking victims. Now, the forced labor case in Hamilton is a dramatic example. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with it, um, we have some links on, on the website, but essentially it's the largest human trafficking uh, bust in Canadian history to date. It involves at least 19 Hungarian men, victims of uh, human trafficking, 10 alleged traffickers, uh, several still at large, and a, quite extreme forms of control. We're talking about locked, uh, kept confined in a basement, fed just once a day and then only scraps, and uh, forced to work at a construction site in Hamilton without any pay. They also, um, this case also involved welfare fraud, which is a very common uh, aspect of human trafficking that we've seen in the United States. So not only does the trafficker exert uh, financial gain, extract financial gain through the forced labor of the victim here in a construction site, they also collect unemployment insurance on behalf of these individuals. And therefore, they're, they're sort of double dipping, really. So it's a very lucrative form of human trafficking. The sectors that are susceptible to forced labor that have been identified internationally are called 3D sectors. These are so-called dirty, difficult, or dangerous sectors. They include things like agriculture, construction, cleaning, domestic work, hospitality. And I can tell you that all of these sectors, we have seen uh, forced labor victims in Canada. The victims are as young as 13 years old. Uh, we document a case of a young girl from a country called St. Vincent and the Grenadines, a very small country in the Caribbean, brought to Canada to work as a babysitter. Um, it turned into, into a horrific nightmare for her. Um, she was basically a domestic servant by day. By night, she was sexually abused by the father of the home. So at once, she was a victim of forced labor trafficking and sex trafficking. And in many cases, we see the distinctions, in fact, blurring. Now, Records that the RCMP released under the Access to Information Act revealed some of the conditions that they have found through their investigations, um, newcomers to Canada being exploited. And I think that this is really uh, not only appalling, uh, the fact that these people came to Canada looking for a better life and end up in these situations, but it's also a tarnish on Canada's reputation. This is the sort of thing that so-called employers are doing with temporary foreign workers, causing them to sleep on mattresses and storage rooms, using garbage bins for wash basins, taking their bank cards for so-called tax purposes. Um, I'll talk later about some of the recommendations to improve the temporary foreign worker program. It's integral to uh, Canada's um, economy. It's integral to the uh, well-being and success of not just newcomers to Canada, but their families back home. And some countries rely heavily on it as a source of, of a tax revenue base. How do we ensure that we, we crack down on this exploitation, which is, which is really uh, completely unacceptable? We'll get into that a little bit later. Now, Canadian sex trafficking victims. This is the third uh, category that I'll, I'll focus on today. Not only is this national in scope, but it is, uh, it is prevalent in, in a number of smaller communities. Um, while forced labor trafficking and foreign sex trafficking uh, tend to be focused in certain regions or cities in Canada, based on our research, Canadian sex trafficking in our own country, the victims being our own citizens, is prevalent across the country. It's not uh, limited to any one uh, region. The victims are as young as 13 years old, and they're recruited through a variety of, of outlets. They've been recruited out of group homes. Behind every one of these cases is, a, is a, these examples is a case or multiple cases, by the way. They're, they're not sort of anecdotal. Um, Aboriginal youth shelters is another one. Centers for abused women. Walking home at high schools by classmates or associates of classmates out of shopping malls, at bus stations, in parks, on Facebook and MySpace. You'll notice that these are all places where not just vulnerable underage children uh, would hang out, um, but any, anyone's child. And it turns out that we've even had cases uh, involving uh, middle-class families whose daughters have been sold by traffickers while the daughter is still living at home and the trafficker using blackmail to control the victim. So when we say that this is in your community, and for some Canadian parents it's literally in their own house and they didn't even know about it. The estimated annual revenue for a single Canadian girl being sold for sex acts is $280,000 per year. 
the traffickers are not only uh, men, but they are also women. Uh, the first set of human trafficking charges laid last month in the province of Manitoba involved a female trafficker. The first uh, conviction in Ontario, also a female trafficker. The reason is, um, we call this sort of the wolf in sheep's clothing. They're much easier to gain access to places like women's shelters, which is where they deliberately recruit, and to befriend um, these women who are roughly their, their own age and, and perhaps slightly younger. The tactics used to control victims of uh, domestic sex trafficking have been analogized by psychologists to the tactics used by, by torturers. And when I first heard that in my interviews, I, I sort of pushed back and I thought, well, this sounds like a bit of a rhetorical flourish. Um, it, it turns out that it's uh, completely accurate. In, in the United States, um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services officials that I met with in Washington, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, told me when, that when they first began 10 years ago trying to treat victims of uh, sex trafficking, they had to uh, bring in the same people they used to treat um, torture survivors who were coming from uh, countries with, with horrific um, methods of torture. The street gangs that are involved, I've identified several here uh, for you. Uh, North Preston's Finest is a Nova Scotia-based street gang. They are, uh, have been extremely active in uh, southwestern Ontario. They have moved into uh, Western Canada now as well, in part, we believe, due to increased law enforcement activity in, uh, in Peel Region. The Peel Regional Police, of course, leading the country on uh, prosecuting domestic sex traffickers. The group, while it is relatively small, it has an incredible reputation for violence. It's an intergenerational street gang. In Calgary, the Calgary Police Vice Unit told me that while there is only a single member of North Preston's Finest in Calgary, the reputation for violence and the use of firearms by these gang members ha has preceded them, and as a result, other traffickers in the Calgary area uh, provide a number of uh, payments to North Preston's Finest representatives in Calgary to leave them alone. So, with that information in mind, I just want to put the question to you to consider, how can we expect the 14-year-old girl who's a victim of this gang to come forward to police in a province where there's nothing in place to provide her with a safe house or accommodations and, and protect her own identity? If, if, if violent criminals are intimidated by the North Preston's Finest Gang, how do we expect a 14-year-old Canadian girl with no family to stand up to them? The Ledbury Banff Crips is a, is a relatively unknown gang. I'd never heard of them. They're based in Old Ottawa South. Um, 15 minutes from Parliament Hill. This gang uh, became so prolific that the province had to bring in an anti-gang program and the age at which it begins to try to ensure young boys in the community don't become members of the gang starts at five years old. Warning signs for both of these violent gangs, the, the Ledbury Banff Crips, by the way, members have also been associated with um, attempted murder, weapons and drugs trafficking in Western Canada. Again, very small, relatively unknown gang. And for both of these gangs, as we did research, we found that we were not the first people to identify these gangs. In the case of the North Preston's Finest Gang, NPF, for over 15 years, um, they have been known to police. Uh, a book was published in 1996 called Somebody's Daughter by a reporter from Halifax documenting what he called at the time the Halifax uh, Toronto Pimping Ring, calling for an end to this gang and the police take greater action against them. They're still here, and they're now nationally active. It's the sons and grandsons of some of these individuals still operating. In 2007, um, police in the greater Toronto area called for an integrated task force to shut down North Preston's finest. That was in 2007. Here we are three years later, and still nothing has been done. And that's why today I'm renewing a call on Premier Dalton McGuinty publicly, what I've already asked him to do privately, which is to create an integrated police task force in the province of Ontario to crack down on these violent sex trafficking operations. Now, with respect to the Ledbury Banff Crips, they too uh, have been known to authorities for some time. Uh, a report published over five years ago um, provided to the Ottawa Police Services Board by the Chief of Police, Vince Beaven at the time, documented that these individuals were active, that they included female gang members who were very pro prolific at recruiting underage girls, and that they needed greater resources to combat what the chief of police called a hardcore street gang. Again, they are still active. Laura Emerson, who's the first convicted female trafficker in Canada, was believed to be an associate. And additionally, there are a number of Haitian gangs that take uh, the street names of some U.S. inner city gangs, the Bloods and the Crips, numerous independent criminals, uh, and there are, are, are others who are involved. Some more information now. This is really another area which we were uh, shocked, our research team, to find out about. This is Canadians becoming victims of sex trafficking in the U.S. 
Um, the tactics that we've seen in, in more than one case include women being approached in shopping malls. There's something called the free trip to Florida scam, and again, we've seen this in multiple cases. It almost always involves Fort Lauderdale. Again, we can't say if it's the same people involved, but there have been more than one instance. Jessie Foster is a missing Canadian woman, never been found. Um, her mother is, is doing everything she can to try to identify her daughter who went missing in Las Vegas. Uh, she was lured to the U.S. with a free trip to Florida ticket. And when she got there, the individual, after a few days of having fun, demanded she repay the money by being sold for prostitution. She was moved to New York, Atlantic City, and eventually to Las Vegas. The last time her mother heard from her was when she said she was going to finally leave the situation and come home, and that was the last call that her mother ever received. A private investigator found that the man that Jesse was with in, in Las Vegas at the time had prior convictions for domestic assaults and was selling her to an escort agency in uh, the Las Vegas area. According to the Edmonton police, $10,000, that's the price per weekend for a Canadian woman to be sold as a sex trafficking victim in Las Vegas. The RCMP also released separate incident reports. These are in multiple cases now that we're seeing this happening. I thought it was just one initially and then the evidence began to accumulate. They revealed how a Canadian victim was, quote, lured from Edmonton to Las Vegas, raped and beaten, then flown to Fort Lauderdale, raped and beaten again, and then forced into prostitution. If I had given you this fact pattern and said that this was in Cambodia and changed the names of the cities, everyone would be saying this is a very clear indication of a sex trafficking ring and we would have uh, international pressure put on Cambodia to deal with it. Well, we're in a privileged position as Canada not to be singled out in the, in the trafficking in persons report. Um, maybe that's a good thing for us for diplomatically, but at the end of the day, um, we really are allowing this to be com complicit in the crime by, by having cases like this go unaddressed. These are our own uh, daughters and sisters who are, who are falling prey to these violent sex traffickers, and anyone who wants more on this can speak to Jesse Foster's mother, who's been very vocal in trying to warn others about this problem. Technology. I'll, uh, I'll speed up a little bit here. We know that Facebook has been used in multiple cases as a recruiting ground for sex traffickers, and uh, it's a, a cause for concern and obviously points to the need for greater public awareness and, and education for at-risk youth. Craigslist has been used um, in, in so many cases that we have now made it a, an advocacy priority uh, to ensure that Craigslist shuts down its erotic services section in Canada as they've done in the U.S. And I want to provide a bit of detail on this one. I won't go through all of these cases on the slide, but suffice it to say, in the Calgary area, in the greater Toronto area, and in the um, British Columbia lower mainland, we have multiple cases now involving Craigslist being used to sell minors for sex acts under the control of traffickers, as well as foreign trafficking victims. You'll notice the dates. This has been going on since at least uh, 2007. They involve missing girls sold for sex on these websites. They involve gang associates. They involve the movement of individuals. And the Calgary police, in an undercover operation called Operation Street Fighter, uh, found that Asian organized crime is using Craigslist as, quote, the medium of choice to sell women. I mentioned Peel Region earlier, their first conviction, and indeed the first conviction in, at, ever in Canada um, that happened in June of 2008 involved two girls being sold on Craigslist, both Canadian. One a 14-year-old with fetal alcohol syndrome, it's a word of the state. The second is a 15-year-old homeless girl. Um, Imani Nakpangi made over $400,000 by selling them uh, out of hotel and motel rooms and frequently advertising them on, on Craigslist. And, and his was really just the first case where the Peel Regional Police uh, saw this happen. And finally, um, more recently in North Vancouver, the RCMP have even sent home warnings uh, indicating that high school students were being recruited by gang members and sold for sex. And I mention North Vancouver because some of you know that this is a relatively well-off area. It's the kind of thing where people are shocked if they ever see uh, someone panhandling on the street. It's, it's across the, um, the, the Lionsgate Bridge. It's in the Serene you know, Mountains. Uh, this really shocked the community. And so if it can happen in all of these parts of the country, uh, it can happen in any community. Now in the U.S., Craigslist has implemented measures to try to put in initially safeguards to stem both the sale of children and the sale of any victim who was controlled by a trafficker. What you see here is data from Craigslist that they presented to uh, Congress in uh, the Congressional Committee last month. Now the very top line you can see is Toronto. Below that is Vancouver, and then far below both of those Canadian cities are major U.S. cities like Chicago, um, New York City, Atlantic City, uh, and I believe Seattle. And what you can see is the U.S. figures taking a, a very steep drop, 
and then a further steep drop, and then um, right down to both the 10% level. This is the monthly percentage of change of the number of ads that appeared in the erotic services section on Craigslist websites in each of these cities. Now, why have the rates in the U.S. gone to just 10% of the number of ads that existed in 2008? And why have the rates in Toronto uh, gone up to almost 100 170% of what they were uh, just two years ago? The reason is Craigslist has been pressured through a combination of threats of litigation and through political pressure to shut down its erotic services website after finding that none of the safeguards they put in were enough. Um, the U.S. Uh, Craigslist sites even went so far as to bring in what was called an adult services section where every single ad was screened by Craigslist employees and then posted if they believed that they did not have indicators of either the person being underaged or a victim of human trafficking. Those of you who work in the field know you'd never be able to tell from looking at a photo and um, sex acts offered and prices whether or not this person was a, a victim or not. And that turned out to be the case. Um, it was simply impossible to weed out those ads. And if you were to carry this map forward to today, what you would find, of course, is the U.S. cities are now at zero because Craigslist has permanently shut down the erotic and adult services sections across the U.S., but so far refused to do so in Canada. The reason they gave is that there's been no concern from expressed from Canadian authorities calling on them to do the same. And so I consider this to be obviously uh, duplicitous on the part of Craigslist, but also if that's what they say they need, let's see some political leaders stand up. That's why uh, this past week um, I've made a, a, a strong call publicly for Craigslist to shut down what CNN calls the Walmart of child sex trafficking on its websites. And today I'm calling on Public Safety Minister Vic Taves and his public uh, safety counterparts with the provincial governments who are meeting in Vancouver this week to demand that Craigslist immediately shut down its erotic services section in Canada. If Craigslist is unwilling to shut down its erotic services section, then charges should be laid under the criminal code against the company, its founder and CEO, for aiding and abetting human trafficking, child trafficking, and the prostitution of minors. And I've already announced that I'm prepared to lay those private criminal charges if they're unwilling to do so on their own initiative. Obviously, that would be a, a last resort, but it's something I'm quite serious about, and we've begun preparing a brief for Crown prosecutors. Let's talk about demand now. We know that human trafficking is demand-driven. That goes for not just sex trafficking, but also forced labor trafficking. Um, I, I, I identify in the book a number of different areas that are really well known for being uh, products made with forced labor. And, uh, you know, it really gives us all pause to think about some of those products that we purchase in our own daily lives. With respect to sex trafficking, we know that few, if any, Canadian men have ever been charged with paying for sex with a trafficking victim. Even though some of the victims, some of them children, have got logbooks where they've kept the names of the Johns, their phone numbers, the sex acts they performed, and those logbooks in the hands of, of police. The poster you see here is from a very high profile public awareness campaign in Manitoba called Stop Sex with Kids. It's been something that the federal and provincial governments have got on board with as well as NGOs. It's an example of a high profile campaign designed to change public attitudes. We need these kind of programs across Canada in addition to tougher ac action to enforce the laws against the purchase of sex acts. The real debate now, of course, is what do we do with our prostitution laws given the recent Ontario case striking down the solicitation, body house, and living off the avails uh, offenses in the province of Ontario. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that on appeal that that case would be overturned, but at the same time, um, the status quo isn't acceptable. It, it still continues to treat people who I consider to be victims as criminals. And that's why I'm really um, strongly recommending the approach that Sweden has taken. I don't have time to describe it in detail. There's an op-ed in the Globe and Mail that's linked on our website, which you can read uh, at your leisure. And of course, we've got a whole section in the book devoted to this. The bottom line is Sweden says the purchasers of sex acts need to be held accountable, both through public uh, education programs, as well as fines and potentially imprisonment, but that those being sold need to be given options and, and exit options to get out. Um, this has worked. A recent study found that this, uh, this solution has not only changed public attitudes and cut uh, prostitution, but more importantly, it has not simply driven the problem underground, as some had feared. As you know, human trafficking has only been a crime in 2005. Um, there have been approximately 30 um, arrests and charges laid, uh, sorry, I should say charges laid, uh, during a two-year period from when the first charge was laid, April 2007 to 2009. Most charges relating to domestic sex trafficking. The concerns that continue to arise are victim intimidation. Um, this has been the reason for a number of charges being withdrawn and inadequate sentences. We really need to do a lot more to uh, put evidence before the courts 
about the effects of this on the community, on the victim, and, and calling for stiffer uh, sanctions. And finally, so-called trafficking-related offenses, some of the very same ones struck down by the Ontario court, um, really uh, that's a, a serious concern. And Tamara Cherry in her recent article in the Sun Media chain uh, provided us with examples from police. And you'll see more in my book where all that often that individuals who are traffickers could be charged with is living off the avails of prostitution. To get a human trafficking conviction, you need generally to have victims cooperating because one of the essential elements of the crime is that they be having uh, fear for their safety. Now, let's look at the good and the bad in Canada on the second uh, so-called P, protecting victims. In BC, we have the Office to Combat Trafficking in Persons. They've been increasing, uh, increasingly providing services for victims as they've come forward. In Alberta, we have a different model, a non-governmental approach, the ACT Alberta group. In Peel Region, the police program, have, uh, program of New Beginnings has really been uh, an amazing example of a, of a law enforcement agency stepping up to help their, their survivors. And as a result of the support they've given and others on this street hearing about it, um, they've built up uh, a real network of trusted informants, and, and this has been the way forward for them. And there are just so many NGOs um, that I mentioned in the book that are, are really heroes in this fight. The bad. We still don't have a national referral mechanism for victims. This is something that would be part of a national action plan. We still do not have any system in place to provide the services, the specialized services trafficking victims need in the most populous provinces of Quebec and Ontario. In both provinces, this has meant victims have spent time locked in immigration detention. Um, in the U.S., there's a law which says a victim should never be uh, detained. If they do need to be detained for their own uh, safety or in any other reason, it must not be in a facility that is not suitable to their status as a victim of crime. And I've suggested that immigration detention, remand centers are not suitable for victims of crime to be imprisoned. In one case, we had an 11-year-old girl over a month in segregated detention in Montreal. Now, the cost of inaction is being paid by victims. Uh, here in Ontario, we know it's the most populous province. It also has the largest number of, of confirmed foreign trafficking cases. We know that street gangs are active here in, in, it, in targeting Canadian victims as well. There's no provincial body to coordinate services to meet the specialized needs of victims. Um, don't assume that the standard services that are available for, for example, domestic abuse are, are going to be able to take victims. We've seen many cases where that's not possible. And unfortunately, because the NGOs who want to provide help are not being linked up through the provincial government with places like Pearson Airport where victims are identified, um, that means that the services that are even available aren't being connected because of a lack of any sort of provincial body in Ontario to provide this uh, service. Police are extremely concerned about this. They believe it is having a negative impact on these cases. And, and that's why one of the other major calls for today is to have uh, the Premier uh, announce immediate action, not only on the side of prosecuting traffickers, but to provide the victim services piece in the province of Ontario. And he's been provided with two models, the BC governmental model or the, Ontario, uh, the Alberta non-governmental model. These are just a few quotes, and I won't read them, but they're just a few quotes which uh, I obtained when asking police in Ontario, what is the provincial government doing? You can see uh, a lot of concern. Um, law enforcement seeing that victims are unable to come forward with confidence due to lack of resources. And in many cases, when uh, battered women's shelters are full, police having to pay for food, shelter, clothing out of their petty cash, and, and, and obviously that's not what that petty cash is meant for. Finally, on prevention, um, there are a few examples of good programs that I've seen. One is this program, um, which is in English, Cinderella Silence. It targets um, girls in Quebec who are 12 years old and older, and that's because that's the age that traffickers are recruiting them. This has been in place since 2002 and is a really good example of an of a age-appropriate model to educate at-risk youth. The Temporary Foreign Worker Program, one of the key recommendations I'm recommending, in addition to what I think are really favorable measures that uh, Jason Kenney, the Minister of Immigration and Citizenship, brought in in October 2009, which would ban employers who um, violate um, labor conditions that were promised. In addition to that, we need what I call whistle whistleblower protection. If someone comes to Canada legally, they're qualified to work here, and they come in on a valid work visa, and they're working away in Canada and end up in a situation like these men did in Hamilton, uh, I believe that we should be providing with alternative employment if they come forward and report on their abuse. They were brought here to meet a need, they were horribly mistreated, and the words of the RCMP treated as modern-day slaves. And to in encourage others to come forward, we need to not only provide them with the option of alternate employment in their chosen sector, for which they were approved to come to Canada on, but also assist them in recouping the lost wages and damages that they would be uh, owed. 
The integrated border enforcement teams. Do we still have the slide up? It's just slipped. Yeah. Uh, it, it is for me. Yeah. Okay. Can you keep clicking through sure, after? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, back, please. Sorry, we just had a little glitch there. The cross-border efforts um, between Canada and the U.S. to disrupt transit trafficking also uh, are, are favorable. They need to be continued. And there was a universally recognized need among all of the individuals I interviewed for this study, which spoke to the need for greater public awareness. Now, where I'll end is on this point. Traffickers have a plan, but Canada does not. Uh, there are literally playbooks, and you'll see an excerpt from one here on the next page, which show traffickers' systematic are systematically using methods to target, control, and exploit and extract the maximum profits uh, from their victims. This is a quote from an excerpt from a book that you can get on Amazon. Here's a photo of it from Amazon, the cover. You can even get a Kindle version of it if you can believe it. It's available as an ebook. This is an excerpt from this manual that was provided to me by, uh, by law enforcement, and they say that this is something that they are aware traffickers use to educate each other. It's a graphic excerpt. I think it's important for people to know that these individuals are, uh, are ruthless and they know what they're doing. I'll read it uh, just briefly to you. It says, you'll start to dress her, think for her, own her. If you and your victim are sexually active, slow it down. After sex, take her shopping for one item. Hair and or nails is fine. She'll de develop a feeling of accomplishment. The shopping after a month will be replaced with cash. The lovemaking turns into raw sex. She'll start to crave the intimacy and be willing to get back into your good graces. After you've broken her spirit, she has no sense of self-value. Now, pimp, put a price tag on the item that you've manufactured. So the traffickers have a plan, but Canada still uh, does not have a national action plan to combat human trafficking. And I've set forth a rec set of recommendations. Some of them are, are quite similar to what um, you'll be familiar with, Joyce Smith's action plan, which I commend to you. Um, and I think it's important to see that not only her uh, consultations, but my own independent consultations, as well as a recent paper provided to the Ministers of Status of Women, have recommended a number of best practices that the federal government adopt. And I'll just briefly outline them, and then we'll move to questions. Today I'm calling on Prime Minister Stephen Harper's government to begin the process of adopting a national action plan to combat human trafficking. This would include funding integrated human trafficking task forces that have been proven to be successful in the United States. It's a cost-effective way to do this and to get around the jurisdictional problems that have been uh, exploited by traffickers. Also to support NGOs. We have a number of great non-governmental organizations doing good work and they need more help. And to work with the provinces to ensure that victims can access needed services. Next, the criminal code needs to be amended to implement the Swedish approach that I talked about earlier. A second key reform is to change the definition of exploitation in the human trafficking offenses to be more consistent with the UN protocol. And I can get into more detail what that would look like in the uh, Q&A if you'd like. The other amendment to the criminal code, it relates to the demand of Canadian men abroad for sex trafficking. And we need to have a system of pre-travel notification for convicted sex offenders and restrict their access online, particularly social networking. Uh, the state of New York has already done this, and it's worked, worked extremely well, and the U.S. government has done the same. If you don't have this in place, it allows for situations um, like the horrific uh, case involving um, uh, Mr. Renshaw, where his passport continues to be renewed and granted even while he's a convicted uh, sex offender. Uh, Ernest Fenwick McIntosh is another recent case from Atlantic Canada, which speaks to the need to deal with this problem. <clears throat> with respect to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, we need to move from the temporary resident permit system that we have, which is at a ministerial uh, direction from 2006, learning from the lessons uh, from the last uh, four years, uh, to legislate protection in the form of protection permits allowing victims from abroad to remain in Canada temporarily to recover from their ordeals and provide those, of, those that really need it with a route to uh, permanent residence. That's not all of them, but certainly there are criteria uh, that should exist for those who, uh, who need that. And I've already talked about the need for the whistleblower protection on the exploited foreign workers' side. For provincial governments, um, and this is the last slide, we need to ensure that each provincial government creates and funds an agency or subsumes it in an existing agency to coordinate assistance for victims. There needs to be a full audit done of all programs of services that victims would need to access to ensure that a victim would be eligible. Victims are not given the luxury of keeping their Ontario health care plan coverage, for example, up to date when they're being exploited by their traffickers. We need to ensure that these strict rules which often exist are, are uh, exempted in their cases. 
We also need to confront demand with car confiscation programs, John schools, and public awareness campaigns. We need to fund exit programs and detox beds for those seeking to leave prostitution. This is the other key part of the Swedish model. It's not just a legal reform. You need to provide options out. And research finds that 85 to 94 percent of those being sold for sex want out but see no option. Frontline professionals, particularly in those sectors that I identified earlier, need to be aware of the warning signs of trafficking. Our kids need to learn about um, resilience and, and, and the warning signs of, of recruiters. The Canadian Centre for Child Protection already has uh, a three inch thick binder of age appropriate material that can do this, so school boards need to get on board with this. And finally we need increased funding for vice units that have been gutted in most of our country, specialized Crown prosecutors to move forward on, on trafficking cases. So to conclude, we have some other uh, points that we'll get into in the question and answer, but I wanted to leave you with these two images. These are groups of, of average Canadians. On the left, you see a group of grandmothers from the Aboriginal community in Winnipeg, who for the last several years have marched through a sacred walk down the streets of Manitoba in Winnipeg, calling for the end to the sexual exploitation and targeting of their children. On the other side, you see young people in Montreal rallying uh, against the lax sentences, in one case, just a single day after conviction for one of the traffickers in the Montreal area. So we know that community responses are a huge part of the problem and in fact are necessary to save the lives of many of these people being exploited. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for your time. We're gonna now take uh, a few questions. What we'll do is you can continue to type in any questions that you have and Sandra will just be uh, reading them. We have a number that are similar so we'll just be grouping them and then I'll try to give as brief an answer as possible so we can move on to as many as we can. Thank you, Ben, for that. Uh quick and uh, comprehensive overview of uh, the situation as it is. Uh, I've heard you before, but every time I hear you, I am, uh, I am absolutely uh, compelled uh, by the horror that must be the lives of individual girls and women who are trafficked. And as a mother, as a daughter, I feel that uh, uh, as a nation and as a province, we must do something about it. So congratulations again for taking this really important work on. There are lots of questions. We have 40 people on the line. But let me kick off by asking you a question about Ontario. Mm -hmm. Ontario is, as you said, the, uh, the province with the most cases of trafficking, is the province where, in fact, the least is being done, notwithstanding your calls on Premier McGuinty. Recently, we've had a change in laws and Ontario courts have struck down laws related to prostitutes. Um, do you have any comments on how this change in the, in the prostitution law, and I'm sure if you could explain it to our listeners, there are a number of questions about this as well. Mm -hmm. How does this change in law, which may or may not go through based on what um, right. uh, uh, Ottawa decides to do, how will this impact the problem that we are discussing today? Well, um, I, I, don't, I don't want to be alarmist and I can't predict the future, but what I can uh, say with some certainty is that if uh, Justice Himmel's ruling stands, then in the province of Ontario, um, the situation would be that there's no longer a crime of public solicitation for prostitution, there's no longer a crime of someone living off the avails of prostitution, and there's no longer a crime of, of being uh, or operating a, 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 a common body house, which is an old English word for a brothel. What that means is it would be completely legal to advertise sex acts in, in public, explicitly. There would be no need to use any kind of thin-veiled language. Uh, that means that immediately police um, would no longer be able to use um, paid sex ads as a source of an investigation. Right? It would be completely legal, as, as legal as it would be to go and order a cheeseburger at McDonald's. That You can't just walk into a McDonald's as a police officer and say, you're selling cheeseburgers, I'm here to investigate crime. That, that there would no longer be legal grounds simply because something is a brothel to investigate it. It would be like if, if it were a factory. The police can't just show up and insist to be let into the back room of, of a legitimate business like a, a coffee shop or a, or a website company. So that's for me that it's that the entry point for investigating sex trafficking cases typically relates to many of these prostitution laws. So we would lose that. The second thing, as I mentioned earlier, is when we get to the pr uh, prosecution stage, um, if the victim in the case is unwilling to provide uh, testimony in court, and if the police are unable to find some other evidence, in some cases they are, but generally it's the victim's uh, cooperation that is needed, then it will be exceedingly difficult, and in some cases impossible, to establish the victim feared for their safety. 
and that, on, on the basis of that, they, they would be acquitted of human trafficking. Now, now what happens is, as you'll see throughout my book, um, many traffickers are convicted of these trafficking-related crimes, as the Department of Justice calls them, and those include the three that I mentioned, particularly the living off the avails and the body house rules. So that's, that's really the problem, and I, I do think that police uh, who have already expressed concerns about this ruling um, are right to be worried and that the, the way forward is to immediately have that decision overturned by the Ontario Court of Appeal um, to set the current state of the law back in place and in the meantime encouraging the uh, federal government to consider the approach in Sweden. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm sure um, we'll continue to, you'll continue to follow uh, the situation and keep us updated on your website or the blog. Here's a question from a listener, a question which I feel sometimes compelled to ask you too. Mm -hmm. Given the disturbing nature of human trafficking, how do you cope? Well, um, a few people have asked me who I who I dedicated the book to. Um, it's dedicated to Cv and then uh, and, and an anonymous person. And um, Cv is uh, a young survivor. She was the first survivor of sex trafficking that I really uh, got to know in Cambodia. She was just nine years old, and I continually to think back to her and now a growing number of survivors, uh, people like Tamea Nagy, uh, Natasha Foley, um, the young Aboriginal girls that I met in, in Winnipeg, we've donated uh, proceeds from the book to help uh, two Aboriginal girls who just turned 18 to get set up in their new homes. These are people without families of their own. They're being uh, you know, basically uh, kicked out because they're not eligible to stay in the youth shelter they've been safe in for now years. I'm going to get a chance to meet those two young girls in, in Winnipeg this week and uh, they sent really heartfelt thank you notes and I never expected to hear anything back from them but it, it's those people, the survivors, and if they have the, the strength to go on um, then we owe it to them to do everything we can to ensure that others like them who can't speak for them, who aren't before the media cameras um, get assistance. Thank you. I think you're right. We can't not do anything and action's not an option. We have a question from Alice Proper is the Swedish model the only way to end demand? What sort of punishments do Swedish clients actually receive? Is there a real punishment or is it generally just a threat of punishment that deters the Johns? Yeah, Sweden has done a number of things. First of all, they've, um, they've rapidly expanded what they call uh, caste groups. These are essentially um, uh, sort of enhanced John schools. Some of you know what a John school is, others of you don't. I'll just briefly explain it and I talk about it in the book quite a bit. A number of cities in Canada, including here in Toronto, have uh, have John School. If someone is a man who is a first-time uh, non-violent offender, so his criteria, um, rather than being criminally prosecuted, if they go to a one-day John School and pay a, uh, an entrance fee, which is around four or five hundred dollars, I believe, then they get exposed to the full sort of picture. So they're talked to by prostituted and trafficked women, by community members, by police, and the impact on on um, the community is, is is raised with them. Now the recidivism rates or the reoffense rates are, are extremely low for men who participate in the program. Um, there's a bit of debate about why that is and I, I get into that in detail in the book. But Sweden's done something similar. So changing public attitudes and changing the attitudes and behavior of men through those programs is one part of the solution that Sweden has also done. But they have also um, uh, imposed fines and in some cases uh, have stiff prison sentences for these men. The recent commission in 2010 recommended doubling the maximum jail time from six months to a year for Swedish men. And for a, for a Nordic country to recommend more jail time, this is not the law and order um, agenda of the, Norwegian, the Norwegians or the Swedes. This model is now spread to other countries. Uh, Norway has adopted it, Iceland. Reportedly, other countries like South Korea, the Philippines are starting to look at it. So it's part of a growing movement because we're not the only country dealing with this. And we know legalization just doesn't work question from Carleen McGinty. What will it take to get the federal government to adopt a national plan? Well, there are some people on the, on the call with the federal government, so you could probably uh, put that question to them. But I, I believe, uh, from having worked on this issue for several years um, with the, with the current, uh, current government, um, that they are going to take this very seriously. Um, the last two times that I've called on the Prime Minister to take action in Canada, the only two times I've asked him to take action, he has done so. Um, the first time was in 2006 when we identified Canada not having a temporary resident permit system or health care for foreign victims. Two months later, um, his government brought that, that law into force and it has saved the lives of, of trafficking victims. It has kinks in it, but it has saved lives. And then the second time is when I uh, intervened and asked for his government to support the passage of Bill C-268. 
and, and his government, uh, we know, got behind that law, and it became the only private member's bill since the 2008 federal election to become law. And so I am hopeful um, that the uh, federal government will take this seriously. Um, I'm hoping that this will remain a, a nonpartisan issue, um, both in Ottawa and at the provincial levels. Um, it does not need to become one, um, but I do believe that public awareness and greater media attention on the issue um, does create movement and, and reason for uh, this to be prioritized. Because unless it's a political priority, it will not get addressed. And uh, fortunately, there's a number of things that we've talked about that are happening that make it more of a political priority. And so I'm hopeful that we'll see some action on this. But again, um, the need to have um, continued advocacy work done from many sectors uh, is, is a necessary part of this. So then let's ask the question about Ontario. What will it take us to make some headway in Ontario? Um, I think one of the drawbacks in Ontario is while there are a number of really well um, well uh, meaning and also very effective non-governmental organizations, there are very effective policing agencies like Peel Region. Um, we don't in Ontario have a sort of central meeting place or a central coalition where these groups regularly are able to meet and be more effective in making recommendations to the provincial government. Um, I, I really think it's an opportunity now um, with this research being done, with the RCMP, the threat assessment being done, to, uh, to see some organizing around um, local groups in Ontario. You know, why not form the, uh, an Ontario coalition against human trafficking? It's you know, be broadly available to uh, any organization or police force to participate in, and its simple mandate would be to improve the provincial response to the problem. A very informal network that could um, create a, a plan of action and an agenda and, and be more of a, a consistent and active lobbying uh, or advocacy force at the provincial level. Um, for my part, I'm going to be focusing today in all of my media on this issue and seeking to raise it to greater public attention. And um, uh, I've already been contacted by the, um, by the official opposition here in Ontario um, who, are, who are quite concerned about this issue, obviously. And so I'm hopeful that, again, it will, it will be an issue that will get greater attention at, at Queen's Park. So I think we have time for just one more question. We'll take it. I know the call was supposed to go till 11. Um, but here's a question from Robin Pike. What are your thoughts on the potential effectiveness of a blue blindfold campaign in Canada? Or have you uncovered a more effective that campaign for Canada? Yeah. So um, uh, those of you who don't know, Robin is the uh, Robin Pike is the executive director of the BC Office to Combat uh, Trafficking in Persons. Um, there's a number of different levels of public awareness that we need to see. Um, I'm always a, a big believer in targeted um, awareness campaigns. Um, Robin's office is currently developing a, uh, a training curriculum for frontline. Uh, professionals to identify the warning signs of human trafficking and identify what can be done for help. It's being developed in, in BC now. I was interviewed for it recently. It will be a, a webcast uh, training program, uh, which as I understand will at some point be made nationally available. So that's needed. But we also need general public awareness uh, in the warning signs. And people need to know that they can call Crime Stoppers to report anonymous tips and, and so forth. Um, so the Blue Blindfold campaign, um, I think, can, uh, can be effective. It, it is a necessary part of the plan, and, and, um, and so I came out uh, uh, applauding the RCMP and the federal government for partnering with Crime Stoppers in this public awareness campaign. Um, I think, though, that what we also need to do is look to what has happened in the U.S., which is um, very, um, very ingenious methods being used to reach out to those who are being exploited. Um, I'm obviously not talking about these publicly, but they have been able to use a number of different, I'll just say, products, for example, that a traffic person may come into contact with, and those products have in foreign languages, which are, um, which are prevalent in this particular community, information about where to go for help. Another idea is what um, has happened in uh, former Yugoslavia. There's been an information line set up for, um, for immigrants in the country, and it's referred to as simply a legal information line. So if you want to find out more about the laws in Canada and about your rights, you can call this line. And once those people are on that line, um, then, of course, the conversation turns to, well, what situation are you in? And it's, it is linked directly to, uh, to operations that can provide them with an escape or rescue option. So Blue Blindfold is helpful, but um, it, it certainly can't be the only thing that's done. Um, I have to say, though, I'm starting to see greater public awareness. Um, you know, the sample of one that I had this morning was the, the taxi cab driver. He knew all about the Swedish model, which amazed me. Um, he was aware that not just foreigners but Canadians were trafficked. And he told me about uh, prostituted women in his cabs who he uh, knew were being sold by, um, by pimps, as he called them. And uh, he said, well, I don't know where I could have reported that, that I dropped her off and that she told me she was being forced to 
uh, ingest these drugs. And he said, I didn't know who to call. And I didn't want to call the police. You know, I didn't want to get involved. And I said, well, you know, you can call Crime Star. Oh, we didn't know that. So, so there is a need for greater public awareness. And we know that certain sectors are more likely to come into contact with traffic persons, like the hospitality sector, like the taxi cab companies. And so I think, again, the, the idea of a targeted awareness is, is probably um, more effective in the, in the end. Thank you, Ben. And thank you to our listeners. Our time is coming to a close, although I'm sure we could ask Ben many questions, but he's got a very busy day. Thank, I'd like to thank Ben for his presentation and wish him luck for the rest of the campaign and this afternoon.